Thank you so much and, and welcome everybody on this uh, very cozy evening. Um, I hope you all uh, relax in your armchairs uh, because we're going to have a wonderful in conversation with uh, Bruce Fogel, a renowned vet and, and writer uh, who uh, wrote one of the greatest books and encyclopedias on, on dogs and if you haven't got it, do get it. Uh, it's full of great insightful knowledge of all kinds of breeds. Um, but Bruce is here because he uh, wrote an essay in a book that we are uh, just literally about to launch, uh, which will be the perfect stocking present for many of you, uh, the uh, Faithful and Fearless Portraits of Dogs, which uh, was meant to accompany an exhibition that uh, you'll be pleased has been postponed to 2024. So keep uh, uh, watch on our websites uh, and, and, and be aware that uh, this exhibition will take place. Um, the book was very kindly sponsored by uh, Kate the Rothschild and her lovely dog Willow. So big thank you to them. Um, and tonight really is an opportunity to really um, look at some of the greatest portraits of dogs by great painters and, and really think about their, their role in our history as much as uh, our own relationships with, with dogs. And some of you that know the Wallace well, um, you can literally go around the collection and pick out all kinds of dogs. If you've got a good eye, you will notice dogs in pretty much every uh, painting object, uh, and we'll look at a few of those. But before we start, um, I just wanted Bruce to tell us a bit about himself. And uh, as, as a sort of backdrop painting, uh, I was very keen to show this great painting by Lancia of a wonderful uh, dog who was part of the Humane Society, a newfounded dog. The Humane Society, Bruce, uh, I, I, when I read your biography, I noticed you were a member of the American Human Society. What, what is a human society? Um, the uh, Humane Society of the United States has an international offshoot called Humane Society International. And its role and function is identical to the RSPCA. Um, the Humane Society of the United States has a budget very similar to the RSPCA. And for about 12 years until last year, I was chair of Humane Society International. That has nothing whatsoever to do with the UK Humane Society. Our Humane Society was a sea rescue organization. So you're choosing this uh, Lancier uh, Newfoundland is absolutely appropriate because these dogs allegedly rescued people from the sea. Now, in fact, I've seen, uh, I've seen a demonstration uh, in the south of France, uh, near Marseille, of uh, Newfoundlands today joining Sea Rescue, where they uh, leave helicopters, not necessarily willingly, I might add, but they jump from helicopters, grab the, the rope uh, hanging from uh, a surfboard or a boat, uh, and tow that boat to, to shore. So we still perpetuate what Lancier uh, idealized in this mm. very, very elegant looking dog. That's uh, wonderful to hear that, because uh, this is actually Bob, who, who is known to have saved 23 lives. Uh, he was rescued, actually, himself. He, he had been a fisherman's uh, uh, dog, and uh, the, the fisherman had drowned. But he, he had made it to the shore by that time, and then he was... Uh, um, uh, basically used as a, as a, a wonderful uh, lifesaver and indeed was given the a membership and a medal to the Humane Society. Um, but in the Wallace, I mean, just so that people understand why there is this interest in dogs here at the Wallace, um, Richard Wallace, who, who brought the collection together uh, here and, and, and uh, eventually gave it through his, his lady, Lady Wallace, to the nation, loved his dogs and he had Snipe, uh, um, the, the, the collection's dog who, who lived uh, pretty much in my office where I'm sitting now. Um, and it's very interesting because when you read about Richard Wallace and his love for dogs, he, when he very famously designed um, those wonderful fountains, Les Fontaines Wallace, which you can still see in Paris, one of the only things he was a bit disappointed with was the fact that he hadn't approved a special design so that the dogs could uh, drink from the bottom part of the fountain. He had thought about all the cups for humans, but he'd forgotten to include uh, the, the, um, the drinking vessels. And it's something that we still have issues that we as dog walkers in London, uh, there are not many places to drink from for, for our dear dogs. Do you find that? I'm told that in, 
that in Istanbul, uh, the water fountains uh, do have dog watering troughs. Mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't seen them. I've seen, I, I've seen <laughs> photographs of them. So there are people who have rectified that mistake. When, uh, when Bruce and I were walking through the wallets, we, of course, rather than uh, looking at the main composition, so say, for example, this is uh, Fragonard's swing, we were looking for dogs. And uh, one of the great pleasures of, of looking at these pictures with, with Bruce was, of course, the fact that he can uh, not only identify the breed, but also bring a, a totally different perspective. And I, I don't know, Bruce, when you see this, this dog uh, yapping away at the lady on the swing, uh, what, what's your first thought? Why has Fragonard put the dog there in the first place? Uh, um, uh, my veterinary clinic is is within walking distance of the Wallace collection. And in fact, my home was uh, on Seymour Street. So I'm, I'm local to you. <laughs> and the dogs that uh, I meet are local to you. Um, and this is one of these little engulf and devour doglets that uh, the, my worst fantasy is that this would be a 35 kilo dog. I don't worry about Rottweilers or, or German Shepherds. These are, these are the little, little ones that you, that catch you unawares, let's say. So uh, a little trepidation looking at that face. Is that right? So when somebody brings that kind of dog at your vet, you, you take a step back before moving forward to examine. Well, the, there's always a lovely soft towel there um, <laughs> that you can wrap around these little thingies um, so that you survive. They're, in, they're, in they're terms gutsy of, little animals. Yeah. I mean, in terms of breed, do you, what do you think this is? It's quite hard to, def to, to sort of define, I very, have to say. It's very difficult. Uh, its ears are flapping up, uh, and they probably drop down into a spaniel uh, mm -hmm. position. So I, it, it would be very difficult to say. There are lots of, uh, of the breeds that are uh, related to the Maltese, the Bolognese, the Havanese, uh, the Coton de Tulliar. Um, but those ears look much more spaniel. This could be a white spaniel, a small mm. white spaniel. Mm, interesting. Um, I mean, we have another lovely little dog in his beautiful 18th century uh, kennel, uh, the kind that Marie Antoinette loved to commission from her furniture makers. Um, and uh, here he's popping out his head because uh, a, poor, a poor lady, her portrait has been rejected by her lover because he's not interested in her anymore. And this is where you get this wonderful understanding the dog is, I, I presume, feeling sorry for her, for the mistress. I, I mean, this kind of relationship between uh, this, the idea of them understanding what the situation is, is that something you, you believe in as, as a vet? Do you, do you go into that kind of narrative? Um, <laughs> all dogs uh, are perhaps more aware of our intention movements uh, and what that means is that they can pick up our feelings and emotions. So something that um, I'll hear every day, if I don't hear it, one of the other vets at my, my clinic uh, will hear is uh, somebody saying, my, my dog understands when I'm feeling low, or my dog understands that I'm, I'm happy. And I do believe that. Uh, I, I'm certain that they can pick up the mood of the owner and fit in with it. So this dog, looking hang dog, uh, is probably allegorical to what the painting is probably trying yeah. to say. Yeah. I, I, I would totally agree with that, I have to say. I mean, there's, um, there's another a group of pictures by Greuze this time, two pictures. One is the broken mirror, because again, she's received a, a letter that's not particularly favorable to her, her heartstrings, and she leaves, breaks the mirror, and the dog is preoccupied. And then on the other one, and she's relaxing and, and the dog looks very relaxed. One thing I noticed was actually it must be the same dog and maybe Kreuz's own dog posing. Um, and that's quite interesting, the idea of, of a dog in different uh, uh, positions as such um, being uh, reused. Um, but, but again, this is maybe a bit like the Spaniel you, you were referring to, do you think, in the swing? Is that there's a similar look there? Well, the, I, I, what, what comes to my mind in looking at these uh, is uh, on, on the right hand side, the fidelity uh, on, on the left, uh, the, the intense focus on uh, the person. 
Mm. And that's what so many of us actually enjoy from our mm. dogs, mm. Mm. Uh, that we get uh, undivided attention from them. Um, uh, mere humans can get distracted by something they're reading or somebody else. Uh, and dogs have this laser focus. It's something that most of us find very, very uh, endearing about them. Mm. And then this, this is um, a Van Dyke, one of our greatest pendant portraits of Marie de Rette and her, her husband, Philippe. And at the bottom of them are their own dogs. And this little uh, King Charles Spaniel, I think, is, is looking across to a very big, quite uh, daunting looking uh, greyhound. Um, but again, it's very subtle. You, a lot of people don't notice them in the portraits because the, the human beings dominate. But when you look down at the floor space, uh, suddenly there is something going on down there. And I just thought this was, uh, I don't know how you, you see this, but I found it such a wonderful captured moment of, of a dog looking outwards somewhere else, um, but very focused. And, and, you say. and Van Dyke probably um, caught the body language of a small dog looking at a large dog very accurately. Um, the, the ears are flattened. That, that's a fearful look. Uh, so I think Van Dyke was probably a good observer of dog behavior as well as uh, of his human subjects. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then just one last detail really is, I mean, this is a Vernet, a great 19th century painter who, who was very famous for painting Napoleonic scenes. And actually we've just quite uh, only today um, done a little display on, on his pictures in our galleries. Um, but here we have a, a wounded trumpeter, a trumpeter, uh, on the left and with his faithful dog licking his wounds and then uh, a very similar dog, a uh, regiment's dog be, who's been wounded and being looked after. And here it's, it's quite interesting because when this, these two pictures were exhibited at the Paris Salon, a lot of people were very moved by not the dog licking the human but the, the injured dog as if that was the main thing to, to focus on. And, and it's true that, you know, if when our dogs do pass away, I mean, I, I can imagine my, my wife being very sad if I die, but if, particularly if my, our dogs were to die, if it should be even sadder, there is a sense of the human emotion is much more openly expressed when our very faithful friends do pass away. I, I don't know how you relate to <laughs> that kind of narrative. But. Well, Xavier, this, this also, uh, the dog on the, on the right is an innocent. The soldier is a soldier. Uh, but will instinctively look upon the dog uh, or the famous World War I of the wounded horse uh, and the soldier uh, cradling the, dog, the, uh, the horse's head while the horse dies. It, it's the death of innocence. And that's why we're so much, mm -hmm. we're, we're so attached. I had the misfortune yesterday of um, having a, a road traffic accident dog brought in that we couldn't do anything about. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody there was, was devastated mm -hmm. by it. Yeah. I have to, uh, but I have, I, I should add that uh, everybody at the clinic gave the owner of the road traffic accidents dog a squeeze on the arm, uh, yeah. a little yeah. something. They all, uh, they all gave whatever support they felt they could give, knowing how devastating it was yeah. to lose it. Uh, yeah. yeah. no, astonishing uh, empathy. I, I fully, fully see that. And then this is just a, a beautiful jewel. I mean, this is the, the great aspect of the warrior says you can discover something different every day and coming across this in one of our vitrines, a tiny jewel that must have hung on either a child's dress or a lady's dress of a, of a lap dog by the looks of it uh, as part of a, a pearl, a, a slightly disfigured pearl, but uh, amazing that dogs find their way uh, in all kinds of uh, artistic media. And uh, I suppose it's, there's something about the memento, something about uh, recording, um, maybe it's to do with fidelity, and, and that's something that I'm sure um, you know a lot about that. that uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's fidelity there, but uh, I can say with 100% certainty that every single woman in my household uh, <laughs> and extended home would kill to have that, to actually <laughs> own that. Uh, that yeah. it, it's absolutely exquisite. Mm. No, no, and it's, uh, I don't think many people know it's, it exists. Now, to really... I missed it. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Well, uh, I, I think I only found it after we walked around, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you... <laughs> we'll walk around again. Okay. Now, 
I've always been very interested in in the concept of when when was the dog domesticated by by humans? When did when did the dog become a best friend? And and this is one of the great Audrey still life paintings, a hunting scene. We we tend to talk about it in terms of the still life, the beautiful peaches, the open melon, the delicious carafe of wine, and we think of it as a pastime. But when you look at the the dog here on the left, looking over to the dead wolf, that's something almost that he's remembering that he is a descendant to the, the wild wolf. It, am I over <laughs> romanticizing this interpretation? Is there something there uh, in terms of the lineage of, of domestic dogs? Um, yeah, I think you are over, <laughs> over, <laughs> over egging it, uh, possibly. Of course, there's a direct lineage. Uh, the dog and the wolf uh, uh, can breed uh, successfully every single time. They're genetically, they're they are virtually identical. The um, the domesticated wolf uh, probably uh, was developed in East Asia, in part of what is now China, and we used to think that it was uh, ten to fifteen thousand years ago. The uh, genetic evidence is that it may well be 40 to 50,000 years ago, long before we became agricultural or we settled in, into settlements. And the, um, it's, it's now been possible over the last 20 years to look at uh, a certain type of uh, DNA in dogs and in wolves and see which dogs are most closely related to the wolf. And this can be the Asian wolf, uh, the North American timber wolf, the European wolf. And the dogs that are, uh, the breeds that are most closely related are the East Asian breeds. The uh, Sharpe, the Shiba Inu, the Chow Chow. Um, and all of these breeds, uh, from my perspective, are the most aloof and therefore the most difficult to train. The dogs in this picture are the most recently evolved. Um, they are there because of the uh, greatest input of our intervention into breeding. Uh, originally, uh, it was dogs self-selectively, or sorry, wolves self-selectively breeding uh, to lack fear near humans. And that was a self-selection mm. to live off the remains from uh, human campsites. But those dogs on the left uh, are basically the pinnacle of dog breeding. If you disregard things like cavapoos and picochons and the various things that are coming along now, where we're going through a dramatic change in uh, how we're breeding. But these dogs uh, were, were bred to be trainable, amenable, to work to the gun. So the gun is, is there, obviously. The shotgun mm -hmm. is there uh, to represent. The, these dogs are working to the gun. Mm -hmm to retrieve the game and not eat it, mm. but to willingly bring it back and, and drop it at, at the hunter's feet. Now, if you think of uh, what a wolf is supposed to do, uh, that's 180 degrees the opposite, to catch it and then just carry it back and give it to somebody else. Mm. So these dogs, and by these dogs, that would mean these are spaniel type dogs, the Spaniels, the Setters, uh, uh, the Retrievers, all of these breeds that were bred to, um, to work to the gun are the ones that are most open to training and most open to uh, uh, a willingness to live with us and to give to us. Mm. We're going through a more recent change in the last uh, 50 years where we're selectively breeding breeds that had been bred for utility. So for example, these dogs were bred for utility. Or let's take a, a Bernese Mountain Dog, a guarding breed, bred totally for utility. And up till 50 years ago, uh, a Bernese Mountain Dog would be there to protect the sheep and would be a dangerous dog if you went anywhere near it. Well, breeders have now selectively bred breeds like that to act more like have a personality more like a retriever, for example. Mm. So it's, it's very unlikely that you'll see the type of uh, protective or possessive aggression in a Bernese mountain dog today mm. 
than in ones 50 years ago. So we're going through another one of these dramatic uh, interventions in the behavior of dogs, where we're converting dogs such as these from their work responsibilities, which in most cases no longer exist for them, into companionship, which mm. is now their major role. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's very interesting. And um, I mean, it's it's interesting to look at some of these uh, portraits uh, by you know some of the greatest artists in in, in art history, and capturing um, dogs through the ages and and seeing their their roles. I mean, uh, I mean here we have a, a dog resting. That's, that's the title. But this, this is a uh, Albrecht Dürer on his on his travels, he's just stopped off in, uh, in Aachen in, in Germany. And he comes across this dog and, and, and draws with silver points, very sensitive a rendition. And, you know, I, I do it as a dog just waiting quite calmly. The only thing that got me perhaps was the collar, the, not the collar, but the actual, the, the ring at the collar that was pulled up. So he must be tied up. But I mean, you, you, you see this and what, what do you see, Bruce? You see something quite different to me, I mean. Right. Well, I, uh, I see ears either amputated or uh, missing through fighting uh, and a collar that is sufficiently wide to protect the jugular vein uh, in case of fights. So this dog could have been there for entertainment, yeah. uh, bull baiting, uh, bear fighting, dog fighting, or it could simply be there as a guardian for the person's estate. Yeah. But this, yeah. this is one tough dog, but even in toughness, uh, when it relaxes aesthetically, it's beautiful. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, and I, I just, I saw it more as a, as a female, you know, dog just relaxing and in the sun. So I got it. I think I, <laughs> my interpretation is, is wholly uh, wrong. I mean, the other one is uh, another one for drawing the British Museum of uh, Parmigianino, by Parmigianino, of, of himself holding his, his bitch. And uh, I mean, if you were brought this dog at the veterinary, what, what would be your first diagnosis? No, I, I say get get out the uh, the, the warm towels, please, because uh, this dog is is going to pup uh, instantly. I think he's probably proud of uh, how many pups she's about to have, yeah. and um, the look on the dog's face that he's captured is, what is this human doing to me? I'm not supposed to stand on my hind legs. I think he's caught that as well. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it's the dog is looking outwards as if somebody's come into the scene that they're talking about the dog. And sometimes when you talk about a dog, about the dog, they seem to know that you're talking about them. And uh, there seems to be that, that kind of uh, energy and dynamic going on. But it's the way the artist has literally displayed everything. It's the underside of a dog that you don't normally see. That's not how yeah. um, dogs are t tend to be portrayed. And it's a quite, a, quite a remarkable drawing. Yeah, it's the, a good vet drawing. Yeah, it's true. Which contrasts with this? Um, we're in the in the catalog, we 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 consider this drawing a, a you know in typical Da Vinci mode, uh, a you know beautifully observed dog's paw that he takes into account the the, the hair that, that comes across the the um, the tendons and the and the bones and the bone structure and then the the, the very f pointed uh, uh, nails. Um, and we sort of celebrate the observation of nature. Um, but you as a vet see it in a very different way. And that really surprised me. I, I was quite uh, taken aback and almost want to write to National Gallery of Scotland to, to ask them to reconsider their, their catalogue entry. <laughs> well, it, um, uh, if it's a dog, it's a very, very heavy dog because of the flat footedness. Um, you, uh, Smaller dogs uh, won't um, put all the pressure on the ball uh, of the pad, and these uh, these are so big that the, the 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 foot is quite flat. The nails are surprisingly sharp, and for a heavy dog, uh, heavy meaning over let's say twenty kilo, uh, the nails uh, and you can see uh, at the, on the lower left foot, the nail is touching the bearing surface, and. Uh, those would wear down. They would, they would be flat at the tip. Uh, very small dogs will have nails that will continue to grow uh, and be sharp, but a heavy dog never, uh, in my experience, doesn't have mm. sharp nails like that. So either it, was, uh, it has spent its life 
uh, in an environment where uh, it wasn't wearing down its nails, or it's not a dog, and I don't know. Um, if it is a dog, I don't, I don't think it's a really good representation uh, I think of, uh, of the... I mean, somewhere I did read that somebody suggested suggest it was actually a bear's paw. But again, I, I'm not good enough on bears. Maybe as a Canadian, you know more about bears. <laughs> if it's, um, well, there are dew claws uh, yeah. on all four feet. There are certain breeds yeah. of dog that will have hind dew claws. In fact, yeah. some have double hind dew claws, yeah. but many breeds don't have hind dew claws. Okay. So I don't know is the answer. Yeah, is right. that the, if, the nails, uh, if the nails were blunt, I'd, I'd go, this is just a, a heavy uh, 30 to 40 kilo dog. The, the, the sharpness surprises me. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, and then this very, very sort of intimate and, uh, and very friendly looking dog, which is by Simon Vouet, better known as a Caravaggisti, a follower of Caravaggio, and, and then a, a very skilled portrait painter to, to Louis XIII in, in France. And this, this comes from a, 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 um, a cahier, a, a sort of notebook almost, of lots of drawings of portraits of people. And suddenly this dog appears. And I, I imagine him as a puppy, as, a, as a, there's something very sweet about him. And I almost imagine him as, as Simon Vouet's own little uh, studio dog. But again, you, you've, <laughs> you've gone for the opposite here. And I, yeah, I've, I've, um, there's gray over the eyes, the gray muzzle um the the quiet look the splayed hind legs to to get rid of any type of arthritic discomfort uh <laughs> this looks like a 13 year old noble dog uh, wow. just monitoring its environment wow i like it and a dog that could be could have had a good career as in hunting and or yeah, there's a, actually a, there's a nick to the ear as well so this yeah uh, good, good spot, dog yeah. had an, uh, an altercation with something, mm. but very, very mature. And I love the way that the Vue has, you know, not struggled, but he's been experimenting with the um, the edges. So there's lots of what we call pentimenti, little changes of mind on the edges of the drawing. If you can see here, the edge here and around here, either the yeah. dog was moving a bit too much, or he was just having trouble getting the right contours. But it's it's a wonderfully experimental. A drawing, I have to say. Um, and then this, this is one of the, actually this, between you and me, this was the dog that inspired the exhibition. It's a, a painting that I've always loved at the Ashmolean. I've loved it because nobody can quite pin down who the artist might be. It's been the Italian scholars think it's Italian and the Spanish uh, art historians and me included think it's likely to be more Spanish. But it's, uh, it's one of those dogs that you see in the, the back streets of, of Valencia or Naples, you know, those quite sort of the poor areas, let's say. And he, he looks so intelligent. I just love that intelligence. Like he looks at you as you walk past. And I'd love to know, if, is, this, is there a breed there? Is this a mongrel? Uh, and what do you think his, his well, background is? Uh, so it's interesting that you uh, use the word intelligent. Um, when you look at that face, uh, and my immediate uh, reaction is hyper alert. Um, so this is a wary, uh, a wary dog. It's unusual where, where the tongue is, but it, mm. it's completely relaxed. It wants to relax, but it's uh, on high alert. I've always found it difficult to use the word uh, intelligent when it comes to describing uh, a dog, or more so in describing breeds. Now, uh, most breeds will describe their breed as an intelligent breed. Uh, and then when you try to define, well, what do you mean by intelligent? Uh, there can be, as with us, emotional intelligence, cognitive intelligence, learned intelligence. Uh, and the same thing applies to dogs. And there are some, uh, some individuals through our selective breeding have developed uh, what you could call an intelligence, uh, an emotional intelligence. In that they read us very well. With your use of the word intelligence here, I say uh, this dog uh, has a difficult life and he's wary and he has learned through experience to uh, keep an eye open at all times, even when he's relaxing as he is here. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine him being a, a scavenger dog that if there's food somewhere, he'll get there. And if there's food to protect, he will be ready to fight. There's something about him. Well, that's interesting because 
he's he's well fed. Mm. His, his ribs aren't <laughs> sticking out. But if you, uh, I had the opportunity to go to Mumbai a few years ago, uh, where there are countless street dogs, um, and I was surprised at how overweight the vast majority of them are. Uh, and that's because there is so much, uh, not only uh, to find themselves, but they're actually given food yeah. because uh, people treat them as their street dogs. Now, yeah. it may well have been the same here. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that in Southern Europe, that uh, there are uh, free-ranging dogs that we think of as stray dogs. But when you then go uh, a bit deeper, they're not stray dogs. Uh, people will describe them, oh yes, that, that, that's our pack. <laughs> and might be leaving out their, uh, their rubbish for them yeah. or actually taking food yeah. to them. And it could, it could be the same here. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. Now we, we have here, I, I, the other aspect of this exhibition is, is um, and the book of course, is, is looking at dogs that belong to artists and, and their relationship and of course, great artists portraying and their own dogs. And one of the most famous being uh, William Hogarth's own self-portrait with his, his pug in the foreground. And indeed, I think Hogarth was playing on the notion that, you know, he was known as being quite pugnacious himself. Uh, and that's interesting in itself, the, uh, the, the idea of master-like dog. I mean, do you buy the concept of master-like dog? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, so um, I, I married a woman with flyaway blonde hair uh, who has a golden retriever. <laughs> so I met my wife <laughs> uh, because she happened to have a dog with flyaway blonde hair as well. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> We, we very often uh, choose dogs uh, either to complement our personalities, to be an extension. Um, but I also see uh, people will get dogs to fill in a void. So the insecure person getting a guarding breed um, because they would like to be more like their dog, but they're not. Now, whether uh, Hogarth thought of himself as pugnacious or um, square jaws. I mean, they, there is a similarity to the, to the looks of these two. Yeah. And what I really like about this is this uh, is a perfect representation of what pugs were before we got at them and we selectively, selectively bred them for extremes. And the extreme, of course, is the flat face. Mm. So the, the yeah. pug today has, has uh, an amazingly flat face. But if you go to the Natural History Museum at Tring, there's a pug there from uh, the late 1800s that has a ski ramp face. Yeah. So yeah, this shows amazing. what could yeah. be done by selectively breeding yeah. back to what they yeah. what they should be like. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I, I mean, I presume you know the pug had. Uh, quite a, an influence on society. I mean, it was very much, I mean, Marie Antoinette loved her pugs. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, Hogarth loved his pug so much that he made a, a mold after him that was turned into Chelsea, a portrait, and here's uh, Trump, he was called, um, turned into an everlasting uh, piece of, uh, of, uh, of porcelain. Uh, but uh, in, what in fact, yeah, so, there, so what, that's perfect, because um, that is the way they should be. And your next illustration is the Disneyfied yeah. pug, um, where we have uh, infantized the face. So like the newborn baby, uh, eyes in the middle, uh, a round face, we, we've, we've created uh, a juvenile infant face, uh, which is one of the reasons that the flat face breeds have become yeah. so popular and so endearing. Yeah, there's a uh, there, there's a uh, a surge in pet ownership right now, and the number of uh, dogs in Britain has gone up from something like uh, eight and a half million to twelve million uh, in a short period of time within within eighteen months. And the the people I see who are now getting uh, uh, getting dogs for the first time are in their twenties and thirties, and because I'm in central London, they work in tech or finance. Uh, they're postponing having kids. And they get exactly what you've got on, on the screen in front of us. Uh, <laughs> something that stares straight at you like, a, like an infant does and has great big endearing Disneyfied eyes. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting you say that because back in the 18th century, there was uh, almost a cult for the pug. And indeed, there was a, 
a, a very illustrious order of the pug. It was a Freemason's pug. I don't know if you know about this, but uh, they, oh. there was a sort of special ritual where the pug would have to scratch on the door. Well, the, the, the human would have to scratch on the door and come in like a pug on, their, on, their, on all fours. And then they had to kiss, I'm sorry to say this online, but they had to kiss the backside of the pug in order to be part of the, of the brethren of this fraternity and such. You will be pleased to hear it was abolished quite quickly because they became so powerful that the Catholic Church had to put an end to it. But it's interesting, this, uh, you talking about the disnifying aspect, but also this uh, strange obsession that one has. And I'm afraid uh, I, I'm part of this, <laughs> Of my wife and children yeah. and I am part of this uh, love for, for pugs. I mean, these are my, my own pugs. Uh, Lady Wallace on the right and, and Winston, uh, her son, <laughs> on the left. And but we, uh, essentially you say that because we did our, all we could to try and find a, breath, uh, a breather that could uh, avoid us having problems with their breathing. And touch wood so far, they, they've, been, they've been okay. Um, but uh, no, I, I, had, uh, at, at my veterinary clinic, uh, two of my nurses uh, have brought their black pugs to work each day. So this this looks just like home. It's interesting <laughs> that uh, this week the Kennel Club uh, issued new guidelines for French bulldogs who have a flat face identical to the pug, um, where they cannot win if they have perfectly flat faces. They're, they want to now breed a ski ramp back uh, yeah. into the face, a, so the, uh, a healthier shape. I mean, that's fascinating. The idea of the aesthetic going backwards and going back to the, the supposed origins. I mean, talking about origins, um, I don't know if you know this extraordinary portrait that belongs to the Queen. Um, it's uh, Luti, who was uh, famously taken uh, during the um, uh, Second Opium Wars when, when the Summer Palace was looted by the British and French forces. Um, this dog was found abandoned and brought back and given to Queen Victoria. And it is said that um, Luti is the first Pekingese uh, to have come from China uh, into, into Great Britain. And of course, was to lead to, you know, to the Pekingese uh, breed, bread, breed sort of um, taking place here in England. It, it, is that correct? Is it, that this, this is the first Pekingese to make the English shores? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I'm in Sussex, very close to Goodwood House, uh, and that's where the first peaks allegedly arrived and then <laughs> moved on to, uh, to be given to Queen Victoria. And it's interesting that that, that dog has a bit of a, uh, of a ski ramp rather than the absolutely flat face where uh, the nose leather uh, virtually touches, touches the eyes. Yeah. That's, a, that's a better shape uh, yeah. than what we're seeing today. Yeah, and I mean, we, you talked about Turing and the Natural History Museum, which I've been to quite a few times because there is an absolutely incredible section on on dogs, and you're so right. You get to see what dogs did look like a good hundred years ago or more, and this yes. is uh, Akum, a famous uh, Pekingese who who was then stuffed and, and, and given for study. I mean, that, that's back to the ski ramp. I, I, I like your <laughs> terminology. Yeah. Uh, um, and that it also looks more like a dog, uh, yeah. that's just a small dog. There was yeah. a wonderful article written in the 1980s by uh, Stephen, Ga Stephen Jay Gould, uh, entitled uh, Walt Disney Meets Conrad Lorenz. Um, and uh, what Stephen Jay Gould described in this was how uh, Mickey Mouse started uh, the eyes were further apart and they were higher up on the forehead. And then as Mickey evolved, uh, the eyes moved to the center of the face and they moved closer together uh, and the nose became a uh, more snub nose. And that's exactly what's been done to that peak. This is, mm -hmm. this is a peak that says 1890. Um, and a hundred years later, uh, that face was absolutely mm -hmm. flat. Mm -hmm. And it would be wonderful if breeders uh, would look at what is entering and start breeding back mm, yeah. to uh, the better physical shape yeah. that dogs had then. Yeah. Um, this is dogs by Gainsborough, his own personal dogs that uh, apparently hung above his fireplace. And here it seems that he doesn't really care that much about the whole concept of breeding and um, is more totally in love with his his dogs. I mean, there's a famous story that whenever he had arguments with his wife, he would uh, write a little note 
and address it to Tristram and Fox, the dog, would take it over to Tristram, who was, you know, the, miss, the Mrs. Gainsborough's favourite dog, and uh, she would then read the, the letter of apology. But uh, I was very taken aback by the teeth, um, that sort of jaw, I mean, is that natural or is it, um, is it something a vet would have to correct? Uh, it's natural, but, but your story um, gets perpetuated today. Uh, I'm involved with a charity called Hearing Dogs for Deaf People. And one of the things that we train um, the, uh, the dog to do is if the dog lives with a deaf child and the mother wants uh, to get a message to the child, uh, the mother puts uh, the message into a little pocket on the collar and says, go to Amy and takes the message to Amy. So that, that still goes on oh, now yeah. in, a, in a wonderful way. Amazing. Uh, that dog ha um, has a genetic undershot jaw. Um, it's, not un it's not uncommon uh, that the lower jaw sticks out uh, like that. Now it's, a, uh, it's classified as a defect in virtually every single breed. Um, so at one time, uh, if somebody wanted all their pups to meet breed standard, uh, those pups would be killed at birth. Mm. And Gainsborough obviously thought big deal. Mm. Uh, I don't mind this at all. Mm. And the dogs don't, uh, other than extreme circumstances, mm. uh, it doesn't inconvenience the dog if, if mm. they have this. Mm. Every now and then the lower uh, canines will grow up into the hard palate. And they have a, a, a little trouble with that. But generally mm. speaking, this isn't a problem. Mm. And when I see dogs like this, their owners think that it's really endearing, that it's not a defect, it's an mm. asset. Mm. Yes. Very. I can see why you're a good vet, uh, Bruce. <laughs> Very kind. Um, the, another, another wonderful little portrait, actually. This is from the Soane Museum, and it's uh, Fanny, a Manchester Terrier, that belonged to Mrs. Soane. And when she died, um, the dog survived her. And I think John Soane, the husband, you know, saw a lot of his own wife in this, in, in Fanny, and indeed commissioned this this portrait of her, uh, sitting interestingly on a. On the classical pillar or Corinthian uh, pilaster, I don't know what it is, um, but in these wonderful ruins. And again, I, I was very interested by the size. I mean, are Manchester Terriers really that small? Or, I mean, what do you figure? What's the narrative here? Is that from your your perspective, Ruth? They, well, they are they are small. Okay. Uh, a Manchester Terrier is, is like a miniaturized uh, Doberman Pinscher. Um, so they're their ears uh, on, on the Manchester Terrier, the ears uh, very often are uh, higher up, but this dog might be slightly worried and has uh, swung the ears back a little bit, uh, might possibly not like the fact that it's being painted, I don't know. Um, and today I think the breed standard is, is they have to be all black and tan. Uh, a little bit of white uh, is easy to creep in genetically. So this has the white flash on the chest. There's a little uh, on the hind legs as well and on the feet. But that, that, um, that's a fine boned little dog. So yeah. uh, it, it's uh, probably a Manchester Terrier as they were then. Yeah. Why he put it on the plinth, do you know? Do you have any idea? Well, I mean, of course, so Love was a great architect and, and uh, you know, took and much of his inspiration from the antique. Is it based on one of his travels uh, to Sicily or, or Greece? Um, I, I mean, are we, are we in Athens? Yeah, actually, it's, uh, um, I, I think it, I mean, I, I think we know that James Ward used a drawing. So this is, might be a portrait done once Fanny had actually died. And there is a lovely tomb, uh, which says, alas, Fanny, uh, in, in the same Museum, you can still see it. So. Um, a very much loved dog, for, for sure. But I think there's a bit of biography there uh, with Soane's love for architecture, just as much as for his dear yeah, wife. And maybe, maybe Fanny is the soul of his wife that you know, lives through Im immortality with, with his great love for, for architecture. I, I don't know. Um, these are, as you know, very personal commissions, which makes it all, all the more fascinating. Um, one picture that we have here at the Wallace is, is Rosa Bonheur's a portrait of Brizot, and um, it's uh, you like to know that it's our most sold postcard. <laughs> Many people love this picture, oh, really? and uh, when it's not hanging, there's a lot of upset, and they wonder where it is. 
but um, it is hanging at the moment, so do not worry. But it's um, I, I love it because it's such a it's a mug shot. It's so frontal. I mean, there's nothing except for the face, and I again slightly romanticizing, but I like the idea of of, of you know Rosa Bonheur was a great painter of animals, but she takes the the portraiture of of, of a dog to a next level, almost as if as if this was a human posing for the artist. There's something very um, penetrating, let's say, in terms of trying to get to know the, the, the dog himself and, or herself. I mean, Brizot is uh, um, the um, a goddess, a goddess that helped sailors, that looked after sailors. So there's something, uh, you know, there. But um, I don't know, do you think you can capture the psychology of a dog through, through portraiture? Is that, is that really possible? Well, we, um, we get distracted by uh, the physical shape of the dog. So we will uh, look at, for example, those pugs in a slightly different way to uh, looking at this very noble dog uh, with these long basset ears and the lush, lush coat. This is, this is a very warm uh, portrait and the dog looks noble. Uh, with no disrespect to your pugs, very <laughs> difficult for a pug to look noble, but that's just because of the, the shape that they come in. Whereas this, mm. this comes in just the perfect package to look elegant and dignified mm. and noble. I can see why it's such a, such a popular poster. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, of course, you know, other great artists such as Lucy Freud loved his whippets, particularly Pluto, who we see here in his bed. And I, I enjoyed your reaction to this when we spoke earlier. I mean, I mean this is the moment when dogs, you know, go go through the different rooms of the house and end up in one's bed. <laughs> it made me laugh. Um, you know, and and I I recapitulate uh, the century when that happened. So I, I was born into a family where um, uh, big dogs uh, stayed in the yard, and on cold nights they'd be in the kitchen. Uh, little dogs were allowed in, but those in the kitchen were eventually allowed into the living room. And then, well, you'll be allowed uh, in the bedroom. Uh, and then, uh, well, okay, on the bed is okay. Um, I did a, uh, a number of years ago, I, I, I wrote a book called Games Pets Play. And the American jacket showed the dog in the bed, and uh, it was a cartoon. Uh, illustration. The dog is in the bed and uh, its male and female owners were lying on the floor beside the bed. Um, <laughs> and, this, uh, and this was based on uh, uh, instance that I knew where the dog started guarding the bed uh, and rather than telling the dog to get off the bed, they took to the spare bedroom is in fact mm -hmm. what they did. So our, our attitude towards dogs uh, <clears throat> has changed phenomenally uh, in the 50 plus years that I've been a vet. Yeah. Uh, and in the bedroom, on the bed, uh, is now the normal, regardless of what the size the dog is. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, we've seen, seen Freud, but now here we have David Hockney with his Stanley and Bowie, where he, he his ductions, who he portrayed in all kinds of positions. I think he, in, in a space of three months or so, he painted them, uh, uh, either lying back on their bed, completely relaxed, <laughs> one of them with slightly uh, one eye open just to notice that something's going on. But um, I think Doc, uh, Hockney took a lot of solace. I think one of his very great friends had, had passed and he took great solace of portraying one after another his, his dogs in different positions. Uh, and I think it gave him a lot of, uh, of you know, calm and, and, and satisfaction in doing so. But it just shows you I, I, I love that uh, you put this on um, uh, on the cover of your book, because by coincidence, uh, at, at the veterinary clinic, I've got a poster uh, of the show that uh, was put on in the 1980s uh, of all of these dogs. Mm. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, you're know, talking about dogs relaxing. <laughs> I, I really wanted to, to put your two wonderful Labradors in them. I mean, the, this is uh, a very homely, cozy uh, look, but uh, tell us about your beautiful Labradors. Apart from I, the fact uh, that I, I, I should explain, 
I should explain to anybody who's uh, who's actually listening that uh, Xavier um, uh, showed me the picture of um, uh, of Lucy and Freud and the dogs uh, in the bed, uh, and that's when I explained, well, we've just changed our attitude and dogs instantly realize that our chairs are much more much more comfortable than the floor. <laughs> and in my family, we didn't give in for the first four that we had. While the children were still at home, the dogs were on the floor. Um, and now the three subsequent to the children no longer being at home uh, are in fact invited onto the furniture. <laughs> um, more seriously now, if you don't mind, Ruth, I mean, there's, we, it goes back a bit to the idea of training dogs to, to fight. And, uh, and, and here I've, I've just selected three portraits by three very different artists, but this is Guachina, the great 17th century Baroque artist who normally paints, uh, you know, religious scenes, but he, he paints this dog that belonged to the Aldo Brandini, Aldo Randi family. Um, I mean, it, he looks like a fighter dog. I mean, there's, there's just something quite uh, ferocious about him. Um, I mean, did yeah, you see that straight away? Or? Uh, uh, yeah, obviously. The, uh, the ears, again, have been cut off um, or have been torn off uh, in fights and the wide collar on the neck. And, and this dog's 40 kilo. You look at those flat feet. He has to be at least 40 kilo. And this is the, this is the type of dog that when... Uh, the Romans arrived uh, in Britain, uh, they discovered that uh, people here were breeding these dogs and the Romans uh, took these dogs throughout their empire. Uh, Britain was the source of these big fighting dogs. So there was certainly a very active and successful breeding of large, large dogs such mm -hmm. as this. And it wasn't just here. Um, the Great Dane is quite rightly called the Great Dane because that's uh, where these large dogs uh, came from. They came from Denmark and uh, the descendants of that are called the Brohomer, uh, which is a breed that got resurrected in the 1980s, but was a, uh, a farm guarding breed. So do dogs such as this uh, had a utilitarian role and still around the world, um, the large breeds will have a utilitarian role. And that's guarding livestock. Mm. Uh, to a lesser extent, they will guard territory, but mm. to a greater extent, uh, guard livestock. This dog um, might have been used in uh, dog fights um, uh, for amusement, uh, or it could have been used in gladiatorial fights, mm. or it could be there to protect property. Yeah. Um, but That's it's one top guy. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting to you talking about the. The fact that in the UK there was this this plenty of breeding dogs, and indeed, one of the beautiful breeds are the foxhounds, who you know used for for fox hunting. And uh, I mean, there's so much focus was given to create the perfect hunting breed. And I mean, here we see a very fine specimen, don't we? Yes. Uh, um, so this shows uh, the evolution from one utilitarian role into another. And on the way, uh, we produced, uh, for example, the short-legged um, heel nippers, uh, the Welsh Corgi. The Welsh Corgi, uh, almost without doubt, descends from dogs brought here by Vikings because they're very similar dogs throughout Scandinavia. Uh, the Foxhound, and they still exist today in large numbers, uh, was selectively bred um, to work with the hunters on horseback, to get on with each other and not attack each other, and uh, to work as a team. They don't necessarily uh, make great human companions if they're raised together because they, they like their pack. But of course, they look uh, uh, upon the people who look after their pack as extended members of the pack. I see very few of them now. I used to see 30 or 40 years ago, I'd, I'd see a fair number of them that had been adopted uh, by people, but I, mm. possibly because there are fewer um, packs today, I yeah. see fewer today. Yeah, no, that's true. And I, I love the, the contrast between this um, English foxhound and then the French hunting dog, and I can't but sort of see a different kind of aesthetic or elegance 
And yet that small head, you can tell that they've been beautifully bred to be fast, nippy and, and very uh, focused in, in, their, in their jobs to recover game. Well, uh, for, from what I've read, the, the French aristocracy bred a far wider range uh, of hunting dogs than we did. Um, they had uh, short-legged ones, long, long-legged, short coat, long coat, hunter, retriever, setter. They had many more than we did, um, but many of them virtually disappeared uh, after the French Revolution. Um, people very intentionally, when uh, these dogs were confiscated from the aristocracy, would crossbreed them with their own breeds um, to eliminate the aristocratic aspect uh, of the hunting dogs. Mm. So many of these breeds uh, died out um, shortly after the French Revolution. Some of them have been recreated more recently. So you, you'll see more and more uh, breeders getting together, looking at a picture like this and saying, how can we recreate this breed? Um, and very carefully, they will select dogs from the locality uh, that this dog came from. And then they might select dogs from hundreds or even thousands of kilometers away who might have a, uh, another uh, input, genetic input. And within seven generations, you can actually recreate a dog that looks like this mm. if you uh, approach it very carefully. Mm. Now, and, and you mentioned that many of these dogs during, after, well, during the French Revolution were, were pretty much abandoned in the streets. And, uh, and it also included all the, the, the lap dogs um, um, that, um, <laughs> that people like Marie Antoinette uh, collected by the dozen. Uh, I, I hear these awful stories, these little lap dogs abandoned in the streets uh, looking for food. And uh, I mean, we, some of us think that this, might, this lap dog might have belonged to Madame de Pompadour of all people. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's interesting that these dogs have that social, uh, they're part of the social backdrop, isn't it? Of, of what was going on at the time. Um, I mean, this is a Havana breed, and, and very interestingly, I mean, I, this portrait is coming to the to the exhibition, but um, one that isn't is, is this beautiful Goya detail uh, from Goya's The Duchess of Alba. And I notice at the back that uh, this is the first time I ever noticed that she's been uh, um, uh, the, the shaved, at the back end is shaved, a bit like the one here. What's this? I I always thought there was something that was done in the in the up uptown east east New York, a very a very New York thing to do. But um, it seems that to go back into the 18th century, perhaps even before, is that is that correct? Yes. I, well, um, I personally find uh, um, what I call canine topiary uh, <laughs> pretty unpleasant. Uh, but it but it has a. It has its origins uh, in clipping for utility. And that little thing's antecedents um, was a water dog. So the, the poodle's ancestors uh, were water dogs, as we, we still have a variety of different breeds of water dogs. Um, and the water dog's responsibility was to retrieve things from the water. So the, um, the, the poodle's uh, ancestry was goes back to the 1400s, 1500s, retrieving arrows from the water. And what would be done is, um, because the coats continue to grow in breeds uh, such as the poodle, uh, and that creates drag in the water, hair would be clipped off to reduce the drag, but it would be left around the joints to give insulation around the joints. So uh, around the hocks, around the hips, hair would be left and leaving those bits of hair evolved into the lion cut. Mm. The, uh, these, what I think are very undignified cuts mm. that very mm. dignified dogs yes. like standard poodles uh, are given. So there is a, there, there's a historical reason for it. And this, this dog, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, it, it has had uh, its hindquarters mm. clipped. Um, mm. And the lion dog today, for show, the so-called lion dog, will also yeah. have its hindquarters. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm conscious of time, so I was going to maybe end with, with Lancia. And here we have his self-portrait. He, as many of you will know, he's one of the great painters of portraits. But uh, 
he painted uh, Prince Albert's favorite dog, Eos, and I think here, yeah, Bruce, you'd agree that, I mean, the, the sheen is, is not only beautiful, but it's the anatomy. He's really captured. Yeah, um, the, the, um, the artist knows his anatomy. I'm sure uh, would have done dissections to yeah. get those muscles yeah. absolutely correct. It's, it's, it's brilliant anatomy on that. Yeah. And um, I mean, Lancio not only painted uh, Prince Albert's favorite dogs, but also Queen Victoria's, this is Dash, the King Charles Spaniel, again in that sort of round all the round of the sort of the round shape being a, a way of, of expressing affection and, and love. Um, but also um, the white the, the white of the eyes. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yes. That, that that humanizes it that little bit more. Yeah. So we're going towards Disney if if I'm gonna follow yeah. <laughs> it's slightly disnified, I agree. And then uh, even Victoria, a very talented uh, artist herself, was able to capture in watercolor some of her other favorite dogs such as Podge here. And then photography, I mean, this is something that where maybe not exactly the end of great portraits in paint by great artists, but photography was gonna take over. And, and as we said that we today are very happily satisfied with quick images from our iPhones of dogs. But do you think, do you think the, the art of portraiture of, of, of dogs is still alive with us, Bruce? Is that something you, you notice in, in your profession? Well, we, uh, I think we have probably half a dozen uh, cards up on the bulletin board at work of uh, uh, dog and cat portrait artists. Uh, and I, I have just the most wonderful portrait uh, of my two dogs at the time and, and Millie the cat um, uh, up on the wall at home uh, that was done by a superb uh, artist named Ann Wilson, an American who caught their, who, who, caught their personalities. These two, <laughs> two golden retrievers at the time had mm. completely different personalities. And she got the worried look in the one and the laconic devil may care uh, in the other. So I think it's, it, it, it lives on. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and I mean, Lancy also specialized in, in dogs taking roles, um, almost human roles. I mean, here we have um, a large, is this a, some kind of bulldog? I, I'm not quite sure what it is actually. Uh, but acting as, as Alexander, who's come to visit Diogenes, and Diogenes responds, you know, you know, please can you get out of my of the sun? You're 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 creating a shadow. I'm getting rather cold. Completely disrespectful. But uh, uh, do you, in terms of dogs taking on human roles, you, I mean, you from, from you don't really take that uh, that view, do you? Well, uh, <laughs> we we, uh, we give them roles. So um, <laughs> this uh, bull terrier relative of Staffies, uh, with his ears, uh, again, cut off. Um, they look like they're cut off. Um, is, is standing in a dominant male stance, and he's muscly. Yeah. So he, he's there to represent the thug. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> the, the bloodhound at the back, uh, with laconic look on his face, um, gives a different impression. The, yeah. the physical attributes that we have intentionally uh, put into the different types of dogs, uh, I'm quite certain says a lot more about us than it says about that individual dog. Yeah. I mean, this is, these were extraordinarily popular in Victorian times. I mean, we have one here, the Wallace of Doubtful Crumbs, where you've got this little terrier watching over and, and hoping that that large, uh, is it a St. Bernard dog? Uh, is yeah, it's probably a St. Bernard. Yeah, about to steal his uh, his bone, but interestingly, when you read the context, uh, it's it's of course pay, based on the on the parable from uh, Saint Luke's uh, the Gospel of Saint Luke about Lazarus, who was at the rich man's door hoping to get some food, and uh, the rich man never gave him gave him anything. But who made it to heaven in the end? Uh, Lazarus, the poor man, <laughs> rich man was left okay. to to rot in hell. So there's the moral side of the story is is very present here. So interesting to, that, you know, dogs should be used to, to tell us about, uh, you know, the morality of, of certain episodes. And then yes. this, this was very strange. I found this in the, in the Tate uh, Reserve uh, collection. You know, two pugs, interestingly with the ski jump nose actually, uh, being offered for sale and, and called Uncle Tom and his wife. And of course it, it relates to the, the famous, or famous novel of, of Uncle Tom. And, and, and slavery, and, and of course, 1833 was the abolition of slavery. So quite political, uh, a picture that really yeah. touches on um, 
on the society yes. at the time. So, yes. But I just wanted to end really with the, the whole, you know, it's, sadly, this is when the master dies and, and the dog uh, will remember and, and, and mourn uh, the loss of his master. And this, this is quite a very moving painter, really, but painting. But uh, the idea that the dog will know when the master is, is, is gone and, and will um, almost sit where the master would have been. I, I, I mean, this is something that I think you know a lot about, don't you, Bruce? Well, that uh, encapsulates what I think is probably at the core of why uh, when we have dogs and they die and we go through all the torment that we go through when they die, uh, foolishly, we turn around and we eventually get another one because we want another living with us. And it's, it's, the, it's the constancy. Um, we're always changing. Our kids, for example, uh, mature from when they're infants to who they are when they're grown ups. The dog always remains the same. Uh, your, your dog at three months of age is not very different to your dog uh, at 13 years of age other than uh, the 13-year-old is, of course, uh, elderly and the three-year-old is a jerk. But, they, but what they provide us, uh, always being there, never questioning, uh, and being totally innocent, is what I think we find so endearing. So we look at this and any dog owner goes, I get it, I, 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 I know exactly uh, why that dog is behaving like that. And we're also going, and my dog would do exactly the same thing. Even if it wouldn't, we will still feel uh, that our dogs would do the same thing. No, and, and Lucian Freud in, uh, in his, uh, he does this wonderful painting of um, um, Pluto's grave. And it's, it's very evocative to see the other side of, of the coin where somebody, an, an owner, you know, mourns the, the loss of their own dog and and here we just see the the, ru the rustle of the leaves in the ground and then this little plaque um so it's uh, to bring everything to an end really i, I think uh, it's it just demonstrates how close that connection is and uh, and thank you bruce for, for really taking us on a wonderful journey really through all these portraits bringing in and uh, this connection that we have but also wonderful uh, information about breeds and um, and also the history of, of, of the domesticization of, of dogs. Thank you so much uh, for, for being with us. Very, very welcome. Thank you. Um, I think we have quick questions. I, I'm going to quickly look at the Q&A, Bruce, see uh, what we have. And I, one, one question I can see here is, I know that dogs are often chosen in paintings to represent loyalty. Uh, is there a further understanding as to why one breed over another are chosen? Size, age, color. Um, can you answer that, Bruce? Do you? Uh, you could probably answer that better uh, than I can. <laughs> I mean, probably be um, there. There are no breeds uh, that are more loyal than yeah. others. Uh, dogs are pack animals. Yeah. Um, so they enjoy being uh, a member of a pack. We sometimes mix it up and, uh, and uh, think that they want a wolf pack mm. where there is the uh, alpha male and the alpha female and all the rest are underlings. And um, dogs look upon us as a member of, uh, of the pack, but it isn't a, a wolf pack as such. It's a, it's a shifting uh, uh, group. And the loyalty that dogs will have will be to basically whoever happens to be the human who is in control. Mm. So if you're the human in control and you're uh, offering food and exercise and comfort uh, and a tickle behind the ears, then uh, I will be loyal to you. And if you go off on holiday um, and, I, and you're no longer around, but this kind woman is uh, uh, I'm now in her house, uh, and she's doing all these things. I'll go, well, I, uh, I love the person who used to look after me, but I'll now be loyal to you. Dogs are much more fickle than we would fantasize that we would like them to be. Mm. Uh, oh, and that's one of the reasons they're so enormously successful. <laughs>
Brilliant answer. Thank you so much. Well, with, uh, without wanting to take up all your evening tonight to our, to our fellow uh, listeners, thank you so much for, for, for coming tonight. And do get the book. You get, I think, uh, a discount if you, booked, if you listen to the talk. So do come. It's on sale in our shop. And, um, and yes, the exhibition 2024. So um, booking online hasn't yet opened, but uh, it will do very soon. Thank you again, Bruce, and, and um, have a, a great Christmas and see you very soon. Good night. Thank you.